why it is in fact a privilege and an honor for me. I begin, of course, by saying all protocol is observed, lest we contribute too much to the equivalent of several sessions of time that have been allocated to formalities. And I'm sure that by now our special and honored guests know that we think of them dearly. So let me get right into the introduction. As I said, it's a great privilege to introduce Professor Norman Gervon, who is recognized here in Jamaica regionally and internationally as one of the leading scholars from the greater Caribbean. And I say scholar because I believe he has transcended his discipline of training, which was economics, almost from the point of his doctoral thesis that pointed to wider political economy concerns of Caribbean development. Since then, while his starting point has been more often than not economic analysis, his work has continued to grow in breadth, depth, and rigor to address all the aspects of the development problematic, especially as they impact on human development. Hence, I think of him as the most senior activist scholar, or as Professor George Beckford, or beloved G. Beck, would have said, a people's scholar. He has never been afraid to take unpopular positions on difficult issues with a passion that seems to grow brighter over time, an uncompromisingly critical perspective, and an admirable honesty that allows him to be an enthusiastic student capable of learning from anyone. Some highlights of his career to indicate the breadth and depth of his contribution to the Caribbean. He began as a lecturer and a researcher at UWI, first St. Augustine, and then Mona, and is known for studies on multinational corporation, bauxite, alumina, technology, foreign capital, uh, general political economy, development, and all of which with a regional perspective. He was chairman of the New World Group at Mona, which, like the scatterlights, lasted for a very short time, <laughs> but which also left an immortal legacy of critical thought on the Caribbean to inspire generations to come. Many times that I thought I came up with a bright idea, I have been humbled by the discovery uh, soon after that it was already part of the new world thought in its essentials. He was chief technical director of the National Planning Agency at one point, um, in charge of planning, that's the name that the Planning Institute of Jamaica um, used to go by, responsible for planning, policy, advice, at the time for economic transformation of the Jamaican economy. And he was a leader in a search for alternatives to the International Monetary Fund strategy of capitalist develop dependent development. I recall the day that we both went to the National Planning Agency and we held a staff meeting to introduce um, for Norman to be introduced as the new chief technical director. I was there beside him as his special advisor with my knitted tam, um, my more knotty than dread locks, and um, a general demeanor that made the staff think that I was Norman's bodyguard. <laughs> that is one of the privileges I've had. He was professor and director of the Consortium Graduate School of Social Sciences at UWI Mona, which has trained many of our outstanding Caribbean technocrats and scholars, some of whom are themselves now professors at the University of the West Indies and other academic institutions. He was secretary general of the Association of Caribbean States, which contributed to building institutions and contributed to building institutions for regional cooperation in the Caribbean in its largest meaning. He was president of the Association of Caribbean Economists, trying to build a profession of economics across the region in all land groups. And I must tell you that throughout the rest of the Caribbean, he has had more recognition and appreciation for this than in the English-speaking Caribbean. I recall being goose-pimpled by a citation of Norman, which was given by the Association of Economists in Havana, in Cuba, ANIC, it's called, that's the um, acronym. And, and I remember Norman's eloquent and gracious acceptance by way of a wide-ranging analysis of the Caribbean development problematic in Spanish. I had to say to myself, 
but, but I know this man. <laughs> and in a sense, it was self-importance by association. I think mean, that's what the psychologists would call it. <laughs> Professor Emeritus at the Institute of International Relations at St. Augustine is his last, his latest um, spot in the university system. And from there, he has been a partisan in investigating the process in terms of the economic partnership agreement on behalf of the Caribbean people. The people of the Caribbean can never claim ignorance of the implications of that agreement thanks to the critical work of Norman and some of his esteemed colleagues. He is the author of many books, many more academic papers, and many, many more technical reports on the widest range of issues imaginable, all ultimately related to the development problematic. He is the manager of his own website, which is arguably one of the best sources of contemporary analysis on matters of development relevant to the Caribbean and small island development, developing states. This website has brought together his work and some of the work of some of his celebrated colleagues, like Havelock Brewster and Carrie Levitt, who are here today with us, as well as several younger colleagues, some of whom are also here, and who are benefiting from a kind of mentorship through cyberspace. Norman has been an international visiting scholar to institutions on almost every continent, particularly the Americas and Africa. He is also an international technocrat with the United Nations Center for Transnational Studies, which I often find interesting because I think that his original path-breaking work on multinationals in bauxite, alumina, and copper contributed to the establishment of that institution but that his own critical investigations of the impact of multinationals on developing countries contributed to the undue haste with which that institution was shut down <laughs> under pressure from the very multinational corporations, which were embarrassed at their ex exposure and under the cloak of a neoliberal hegemony that sought to free up the multinational corporations to pursue their own global interests. Currently, he's on some high-level committee set up by the UN Secretary General to manage an impossible task, this dispute between Venezuela and Guyana. But most important to him, I think, are his devotion to family, the commitment to the duties of citizenship in his native Jamaica, and one of his several adopted Caribbean homes, Trinidad and Tobago, where he currently lives, and the celebration of life that is known as Caribbean culture. And I think all of the above ultimately subsume themselves in service to these three sets of priorities in Norman's life. Well, as Buju would say, I could go on and on and the poor would never be told. Norman is here to share his own reflections on a period of history in which he was actively engaged intellectually and practically in every year of its passage. The title of this talk, Reflections on 50 Years of Independence, Continuity Change and Challenges, suggests the issues that he intends to raise in our minds, especially with the play on the word independence by way of a, a hyphen between the syllables in and dependence to, commute, to suggest to us that it may be in dependence as opposed to independence. I say share because he is most keen for engagement with the issues he will raise in the discussions after the presentation. Um, I think I'm going to ask you to formulate your questions and comments succinctly to allow for maximum efficiency in the use of discussion time on this very special occasion. Apart from myself, I'm only allowing Norman to give a plenary this evening. <laughs> Could I invite you to, sh to share what I regard as an honor to participate in this reasoning this evening. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mikey, for that very moving um, <laughs> introduction. I didn't recognize the person you were, <laughs> you were introducing, but I have only one comment. If indeed you are my bodyguard, you did an extremely good job. <laughs> but I'm still here. So let me begin by observing all protocols and thanking um, Brian, especially, um, for inviting me to do this plenary. The 
theme of this conference is critical reflections in a time of uncertainty. And I want to assure Brian and everyone else that I've done my best to stick to the mandate and to obey the mandate to be critical reflections. Critical reflections. Um, it's a personal pleasure for me because I, I go back a long way with ISCR, the predecessor to Salises, and to Salises itself. I have very fond memories of lively discussions over the years in that institution um, with many scholars, some of whom have passed, uh, people like M.G. Smith, Lloyd Brathwaite, Archie Singham, George Beckford, Carl Stone, and many others. And I, I give tribute to the contributions and to the memory of these scholars who have been associated and from whom I have learned so much. So, at the time that Jamaica became independent, I had just turned 21 which in those days was known by the great phrase, the age of majority. And I had just graduated from the UWI with a degree in economics. The coincidence of the legal nationhood with my own legal adulthood and professional certification seemed to impel me naturally with a lifetime vocation to use professional training in the project of nation building. This was very common amongst my generation. In fact, I would say it was the predominant um, spirit of my generation and indeed of many generations to follow. In the case of my own particular cohort, the 1962 cohort, that was tinged with regret at the collapse of the project for collective West Indian nationhood Together with others such as Orlando Patterson and Walter Rodney, we were part of a group known as the West Indian Society for the Study of Social Issues, which discussed the problems of colonialism in its economic, sociological, and political dimensions, and which brainstormed about the characteristics of an independent West Indian nation that would eradicate these problems and transform the society. <coughs> Excuse me. We always saw our respective territories as variants of a common West Indian condition. And we never had any doubt that these issues had to be tackled collectively. I like to say that I entered Mona as a Jamaican nationalist, and I left as a Caribbean regionalist and I, the, the, that the one melds seamlessly into the other, that I have never understood or accepted that there is any antagonism or incompatibility between the two, and that I believe that those who indeed believe that there is such an incompatibility are either unaware of our history or choose to ignore it. The disappointment that my cohort felt was due not only to the breakup of the Federation, but perhaps even more so with what we perceived to be the neo-colonial character of the Independence Pact, which was represented by a constitution that preserved the British monarch as the Jamaican head of state and entrenched property rights. Orlando Patterson summed up the outrage in a famous editorial published in the Pelican magazine, student magazine, which began with the declamation, we have been betrayed. And it ended with a passionate creed accord, which was directed at our political leaders. And here I must give a warning that um, what I'm about to say is a verbatim quote from Professor Orlando Patterson, 
and it, some may even find it offensive, but these were his words. Oh, you greedy cabal, you fools. You cannot lead the people to independence wearing a waistcoat. You have been brainwashed in the rank urine of British culture. End of quote. This is not me speaking. This is John Cowles, professor of sociology at Harvard University, <laughs> who was then editor of the Pelican magazine. Looking back, it is clear that our cohort overestimated the possibility for radical transformation and underestimated the forces of continuity in societies that are, after all, not new, but hundreds of years old with deeply ingrained cultural values, patterns of behavior, class and color stratification, economic structures, and political habits, and that we fail to take account of the role of emerging national elites in being content to acquire a limited degree of autonomy within an existing system of, inter of internal and international hierarchical structures. Trevor Monroe, in his analysis of the politics of constitutional decolonization, constitutional decolonization, and I see the book which is available outside, his analysis showed that Jamaica's political class and the departing British had colluded in a transfer of formal political authority to an institutionalized party duopoly of power with the essentials of the system remaining intact and entrenched in a constitution that was virtually impossible to change without the agreement of the two political parties. I take it, Trevor, that you are still uh, in a position to own this analysis. <laughs> However, for such a system to serve its purpose of delivering political stability, the population must be made to believe that it is, in fact, what it is not. Louis Lindsay's analysis of the myth of independence and the politics of symbolic manipulation, drawing on Franz Fanon, argued persuasively that flag independence and five yearly elections had become symbols to be manipulated, to give the population the illusion that it had acquired genuine control over its own affairs and had acquired real participation in political making, in political decision making. But if the more things change, the more they remain the same. It is also the case that for the, the more they remain the same, the more they have to appear to have changed. Later, Carl Stone squared the circle by showing that patronage and clientelism had become part and parcel of the functioning of the Jamaican two-party political system. In the 1980s, Carl pointed out, pointed to the insidious dangers of garrison politics, and he warned that the tail would end up wagging the dog. That was 20 years before Dudos. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Patterson once said in a moment of candor something to the effect that Jamaican politics consisted of warring tribes fighting over scarce benefits. So is it any wonder that voter participation in elections has shown a secular decline to just about or just over one half in the last election? The current administration holds office on the basis of less than one third of the qualified voters. And that in a poll taken in mid 2011, a significant majority, in fact 60% of respondents, said that they believed that Jamaica would have been better off had it remained a British colony. 
These uncomfortable and embarrassing statistics are a damning indictment by the population of our political elites, of the state of Jamaican democracy, and of the results of the independence project. My reflections will hopefully help to explain the statistics of this kind and to complement the insights of the scholars I have mentioned with an overview of the post-colonial political economy. Not 50 years, perhaps, of independence, but 50 years in dependence. Before I proceed, however, I would like to say that there is a sense I get in the proceedings so far of this conference of an elephant in the room which overshadows much of what we talk about, but which is not being explicitly addressed. And which is that the wider world in which we live, and to which the Caribbean is, of course, closely linked, is enmeshed in a deep crisis of multiple dimensions, financial, economic, social, political, and environmental, and indeed, that many keen observers believe that behind this there lies a civilizational crisis, meaning that our present model of civilization of the world community, based as it is on the goal of the unlimited and the permanent accumulation of material wealth, is fundamentally unsustainable. Clearly, this is not within my remit. But may I sus respectfully suggest that the discussion of the region's development over the next 50 years must take this global context as one of its principal points of departure. So in my overview, I will move quickly over the 60s and the 70s, in reality, the period to 1976, but focus especially on the last 35 years from 1977 to the present. Beginning with the 60s, at the time of independence, it was generally believed that the road to economic development led through foreign investment. You can, it has been called the period of industrialization by invitation. So the role of foreign capital was the chosen subject of my doctoral thesis. My main conclusion was that while foreign investment had driven rapid growth in the Jamaican economy, in the 50s and 60s, the economy had not undergone the kind of structural changes that would permit growth to be self-sustaining after the end of the bauxite investment cycle. This was indeed pretty much confirmed after 1972, when the, Jamaican, when the cycle came to an end and the Jamaican economy entered a prolonged growth crisis. The structural changes that one would have liked to have seen, but which did not take place, included a significant rise in national savings linked to productive investment through the agency of national entrepreneurship and indigenous technological effort. Agricultural and industrial diversification and a financial system supportive of development. I attributed this failure partly to the role of foreign firms and multinational corporations in the economy. These ideas were generally shared by my generation of economists, as was mentioned, the New World Group and Caribbean structuralists, with seminal contributions on the Jamaican case being made by Owen Jefferson and George Beckford. I'm not sure if Owen is here today, but I wish to recognize his outstanding contribution. The 70s. In the first half of the 70s, the Michael Mandel government implemented comprehensive and long overdue social reforms in order to address the social deficit of the population, which was a legacy of 300 years of colonial rule, slavery, and the plantation system. The state took control of much of the commanding heights of the economy and levied additional taxes on the bauxite industry, 
and the government campaigned for a more just and equitable international system for poor countries, a new international economic order. The program was derailed by the first oil, oil price shock, by capital flight, disinvestment, by domestic and foreign opposition, and indeed also by its own internal errors and contradictions. With its foreign reserves depleted in 1977, Jamaica entered into what was to be the first of a succession of adjustment programs financed by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and other Western donors. These loans were conditioned on the adoption of neoliberal policy reforms of privatization, liberalization, and deregulation, and on the privileging of market forces and of the role of the private sector. For 35 years of the 50-year independence experience, therefore, Jamaican economic policy has been under the direct supervision of the Washington-based international financial institutions, or during the periods when such programs were not ruling the, the macroeconomic policy, carried out within a framework approved by the, these institutions and aimed at maintaining the confidence of donors, lenders, and investors. One consequence of this is that successive Jamaican governments have surrendered many, if not most, of the policy tools for the shaping of economic development by the state, which it had acquired, which, which the state had acquired in the late colonial and early post-colonial period. Among the most important were abolition of the commodity marketing boards, elimination of state import trading, removal of import controls, reduction and elimination of tariff protection for industry and agriculture, removal of price controls, elimination of credit controls, financial liberalization, floating of the exchange rate, elimination of preferential interest rates for agricultural credit, cuts in support for agricultural research and development, and abolition of progressive income taxes. Previous state interventionism may well have been excessive and at times even inefficient and corrupt. But I believe that the abandonment of such policy instruments went too far. And I know for a fact that some of them, some of this happened not because government officials were convinced that it would be good for the economy, but because they were forced to do so by the international financial institutions. The last IMF agreement made in 2010 is a clear demonstration of the extent to which the Jamaican state has lost the ability to independently determine its own policy. The letter of intent and its annexes outline 10 undertakings by the government in the area of fiscal policy, three undertakings in the area of monetary policy, and over 40 actions of structural reform under various headings to be undertaken between one and two fiscal years including undertakings to change a number of existing laws and regulations. There are also nine different quantitative performance criteria which the government must observe. On top of all of this, the government of Jamaica is obligated to make daily reports to the IMF on 13 items 
weekly reports on six items, monthly reports on 22 items, and quarterly reports on 10 items. It will be an interesting project that I'm looking at Brian here. Or even Mike. It will be an interesting project for some research student to compare the powers presently exercised by the IMF over Jamaica's economic policy with those exercised by the British governor and the colonial office in London under Crown Colony rule. Of course, I'm not referring to power in the constitutional sense, but the real power exercised by the IMF by means of financial leverage and its intrusion into a vast range of public policies. I'm going to argue that the results from this 35-year neoliberal policy orientation have not only fallen far short of what was promised, but also that they have been accompanied by changes in the nature of Jamaica's economic life Changes which are for the most part negative and in some cases even alarming. These results help to contextualize the voter apathy, the sense of powerlessness, and the noticeable tendency towards popular disillusionment with the independence project. I summarize these results under the rubric of nine interrelated processes. Some of them have been dealt with in, um, in, in panel discussions that we have had so far in separate ways. I would like to suggest that these processes to which I'm going to refer are interconnected and all part of a total, total experience of the neoliberal policy orientation. Very quickly, one, economic stagnation. Two, a hollowing out of production of the Jamaican economy. Three, what I call tradification. Four, what I call rem remittanceization of the economy. <laughs> Five, financialization of the economy. Six, informalization. Seven, criminalization. Eight, emigration, which I prefer to call human resource decapitalization. And finally, the growth of indebtedness, which, for the sake of rhyming, I call debtification. <laughs> As I mentioned, many of you will be familiar with these developments, and some of them have been dealt with. But, uh, uh, and in my written paper, I have a number of statistics to uh, buttress these trends, and therefore I will simply refer to some of the highlights, and especially the particular interpretations that I wish to, to, uh, to put on these developments. Economic stagnation has been mentioned several times. I merely want to add to what has been said about the anemic growth of the Jamaican economy over the last, at least over the last 30 and probably over the last 35 years, has been that the, the performance gap has been widening. Since 1991, Jamaica's per capita income growth has been less than one third that of Caribbean small countries, and less than one-fourth that of developing countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. With regard to the hollowing out of production, the productive base of the economy, which is one of the uh, factors underlying economic stagnation, the three main goods producing sectors of the economy, agriculture, mining, and manufacturing, today are less than half of the contribution to the GDP and to the employment as they were 
30 years ago. In fact, real output in mining and in manufacturing has declined in absolute terms, whereas agriculture has shown only very marginal growth. The other side of the coin is that, as a society, we have become far more import dependent in satisfying consumer needs. The imports of food and of raw materials for the food industry running at over $1 billion a year. The third process I mentioned is tradification of the economy, meaning that trading in imported goods has become one of the growth activities to an even greater degree than before. Financialization is a feature of development since the 1980s, whose significance, I believe, is sometimes um, under-recognized. This, by the way, is also a feature of the global capitalist economy. But as long ago as 1971, Finance in the Jamaican GDP was only about one-tenth of the combined share of the basic producing sectors. Today, finance exceeds mining in real output by a very wide margin. It exceeds agriculture in real output also by a wide margin and is also greater than manufacturing. The significance of this is that financialization is one of the mechanisms by which resources are transferred from what economists call the real economy to holders of financial assets. And it correlates with the hollowing out of the goods producing sectors. The next four processes I see as, inter again, interconnected parts of, in a sense, a single phenomenon, which one might call the response of the population in response to these pressures in various ways. And these are the, these are the processes of informalization, criminalization, emigration, and remittanceization. I won't go into the statistical details of the growth of the informal economy, about 40% of the GDP, the growth of the criminal economy, which is, in which we have some evidence that is a factor in every sector of economic life in Jamaica. But as you can imagine, the uh, hard data on this is not exactly easy to collect, as if you try to do so, you might turn out to be hazardous to your health. <laughs> Dr. Witter has done some work on this. Um, the matter of immigration, I want to say a little bit more about. Because I think of immigration, and I suggest we start to think about it as a form of decapitalization of the economy, depletion of the human resources of the country. Since the 1960s and right up to the present day, we have been losing an estimated one third of our secondary school graduates and between 70 and 80% of our tertiary level graduates. I just saw some data in the previous panels putting a figure of 82% for Jamaica. This is not a matter of neoliberal policies only. But clearly, neoliberal policies have not helped. Since the economy has stagnated, violent crime has become endemic, and the social services are in poor shape. But the other side of this is that remittances by overseas Jamaicans have grown to become the largest single source of foreign currency inflows for the economy. If remittances are more than earnings from merchandise exports, more than foreign investment, more than loans, more than aid, and more than tourism, if you net out the direct leakage from tourist expenditure. expenditure. I am not one of those who believes that these flows in any way compensate for the loss of human resources or for the government money spent on their education and training. And there is indeed some economic analysis to support this. What I want to suggest 
is that this phenomenon has a fourfold or even a fivefold significance of both social and economic in its dimensions. First, it is an indicator of the failure of the society to provide meaningful economic and social opportunities for a substantial part of the educated population. Second, it is an indicator of the talent, resourcefulness, and energy of ordinary Jamaicans. Third, it is a source that is critical to sustaining consumption levels in a large number of households, and hence to maintaining the social fabric. But fourth, it is an indicator of the potential production that could be generated within Jamaica if people had the opportunities here. No one knows the size of the Jamaican diaspora economy. A very rough estimate I, I, uh, I have done to give me an idea of the, of the magnitude of the overseas economy would suggest that it could be as large as the total GDP of the island of Jamaica itself. And if we like, we can go into it in the question, in the question period. The production, therefore, generated by overseas Jamaicans, and perhaps even more importantly, the leadership provided overseas by what in effect constitutes a large part of the best and brightest of the population, the leadership provided in medicine, in law, in politics, in education, in public health, in engineering across the entire range of services, professions, and skilled services of the overseas population, to my mind, represents the true cost of the loss of this population. I come now to the ninth process, which is the huge growth of Jamaica's debt burden. Already by 1990, the servicing of the external debt was costing the Jamaican economy over one quarter of its annual output of goods and services. A seminal paper done by Professor Carrick Levitt, who is here with us, on the growth of Jamaica's debt from 1970 to 1990 makes very instructive reading. One quarter of Jamaica's annual output was being used, was, was the cost of the external debt in 1990. Now in the 1990s, there was a huge increase in the internal debt. Due to the financial sector meltdown, the FinSAC bailouts, and high interest rates. At the root of this huge growth in the internal debt was the currency and financial deregulation of 1990. And I would like to say that I believe that this measure, the currency and financial deregulation of 1990, which was carried out in a naive belief in free market economics, was arguably the greatest single policy mistake made in all of Jamaica's 50-year post-colonial history. In a paper that I wrote in 1999, I argued that Jamaica was caught in an internal debt trap in which debt service payments exceeded new borrowing but the stock of debt continued to grow. Let me just give you some data on that. During the 1990s, the cost of government debt servicing grew from 45% to 113% of government revenue, and from 15% of the GDP to 39% of the GDP. During the decade of the 1990s, the government had paid out $70 billion Jamaican more in interest and amortization than it, more than it had received in new loans. But the stock of government debt had grown by $223 billion. 
Jamaican dollars. So the government had paid out more in debt servicing than it had taken in in new loans, but the stock of the debt had grown by $223 billion. The debt, I argued at that time, had become a major drag on economic growth by diverting funds from productive investments and on the human capital stock of the country by contributing, by compressing expenditures on education and health. At that time, I proposed a negotiated restructuring of the internal debt with the savings allocated to investment in rebuilding the social and economic infrastructure. This, of course, did not happen. And during the 2000s, the economic growth of Jamaica was the lowest of, three of the three decades since 1980. It was not until 2009 when a, the prospect of a, of a debt default was a very real one that the Jamaica debt, ex debt exchange was carried out, indeed, which the IMF virtually made a condition of its standby agreement. But it seems that the savings on the Jamaican, the Jamaica debt exchange were used mainly to reduce the fiscal deficit rather than to invest in rebuilding productive capacity. In any case, it now seems clear that the 2009 program was inadequate. It's, as a recent report on the Jamaican economy carried out by the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington said, concluded, quote, or pointed out, quote, Jamaica remains one of the most highly indebted countries in the world. Jamaica's large debt burden has displaced most other public expenditures, taking up almost 50% of total budgeted expenditure over the last four years, while health and education have been only around 20% combined, end of quote. There is a tenth process in my list, which I call culturalization. It refers to the mushrooming of cultural activity as sources of income and employment and as a source of foreign earnings. And the point here, of course, is, this, is that this is another indicator of the potential that originates in the creativity, the resourcefulness, and the talent of the mass of the Jamaican population, as we have so recently and joyously experienced by the extraordinary achievements of our athletes. In spite of the limited money and resources that we have, and in spite of coming from one of the smallest countries on the planet, Indeed, I quote Professor Levitt again, who said, wrote, development is a cultural process. It is rooted in the culture and the creative potential of a people. It comes from within, end of quote. But these things have flourished, not for the most part because of economic policies, but in spite of them. The interconnected processes that I have described add up to an experience that I call economic retrogression in the age of neoliberalism. I believe that once we view it in its totality, it becomes easier to understand why the announced plans for economic diversification have such modest results, as for example with the National Industrial Policy and Vision 2030. The overall policy framework in which these plans are published and are presented is not supportive. In fact, it is pointing investors in other directions. In short, do we really expect that agriculture and food production will be attractive when cheap subsidized food is freely imported? 
when arable land is not available at low cost to those who may want to farm it, when pre jail arsony is prevalent, when bankers demand collateral that you don't have, when you don't know if your crop won't be destroyed by floods or pests, and even if it is not, if you will be able to find a market for it. Can we really expect that entrepreneurs will flock into new export businesses when it is easier to invest in government paper or safer and more profitable to invest in building upper-class housing and less risky to do import trading and fast food franchising? And when, in addition, borrowers are hobbled by high interest rates, isn't it perfectly understandable that the best and brightest, for the best and brightest of our young people who make it through the education system, the professions of choice in the past 20 years or so have been finance and information technology, and far less so for farming and non-traditional exports? The thing to do in the 90s and the 2000s was to get a business degree, preferably an MBA, and preferably in finance, and to get a good job in a leading financial institution. Can we really blame them? So what I'm suggesting is that the diversification plans may look good on paper, but the overall environment of fiscal, monetary, and trade policies create a different reality on the ground to which investors respond. So my next section is entitled Recovering Policy Independence. At the core of the experience I have described, <clears throat> is the policy recolonization of the Jamaican state and the gutting of its capacity to influence economic life of all of the most elementary tools, with the exception of, of all but the most elementary tools of the fiscal budget and central bank operations. One can therefore go, go further and ask whether, given the nature of the independence pact, which Trevor and Louis so well uh, analyzed, that was inherited, whether, in fact, it was not programmed in a way that caused political elites to revert to external patrons once the reproduction of the system was disrupted by political and economic shocks of the kind that occurred in the 70s and 80s. This reversion to external patrons went beyond the securing of material, financial, and political support to a kind of intellectual recolonization by invitation which takes the form of an increasingly ready acceptance by policy elites of the diagnostic and prescriptive frameworks handed down by those with the money and the power. However, the system may now have entered a phase of more or less permanent crisis whose most Powerful manifestations are the ongoing fiscal crisis of the Jamaican state and inability to staunch the continued huge hemorrhage of the educated cater. One is tempted to compare the present historical conjunction with the situation as it obtained in the 1930s, a century after emancipation. Emancipation, like independence, had generated enormous expectations within the population, expectations which were soon frustrated by the persistence of the colonial 
of the planter colonial order. That frustration was partially relieved during the 19th century by internal and external migration. But by the turn of the century, this relief had been, this form of relief had been exhausted. But it took the consequences of the capitalist crisis of the 1930s, internal and international consequences, to bring about the conditions which resulted in a rupture in the established order. We cannot rule out the possibility of another rupture of this kind, as we are in the midst of a prolonged world capitalist crisis, similar to that of the 1930s, at a time when the national project appears to have run its course. However, emigration continues to be the wild card in the back. In the 1930s, people were coming back, um, were being sent home from overseas as a result of the crisis. But emigration in the 2000s continues to be a safety balance, safety balance. The Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street seem to have had no traction or limited traction in Jamaica, or for that matter, in the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean. Now, it has the guess that one reason for this is that the social strata that predominantly drive these protests elsewhere, in our case, have already left or are leaving in large numbers, another, another possible area for research. Also, there is, even if there would be such a rupture or even a revolutionary up Evil, there, there is no certainty as what would be the ultimate result. As history offers numerous examples of the operation of the law of unintended consequences, we have seen the results of the Arab Spring in Egypt, eventually bringing to power and government of the Islamic Brotherhood. And uh, today I read that an IMF mission is to come to Egypt to sign, to negotiate, and agree with it. If the ruling elites in this country are to have a chance of rescuing the national project, however, and here I want to say that in its broadest sense, the ruling elites, as distinct from the policy elites and the political elites, which are components. But in its broadest sense, the, the ruling elites include the intelligentsia, such as those attending this conference, people like myself and all of us in this room. That is to say, leaders in academia, in the private sector, in the media, in the churches, in the, civil, in the civic organizations, which are primarily res uh, responsible for policy discourses in this country and affect the overall climate of opinion within which the political parties and governments operate. If the national project is to be rescued by the ruling elites, we have some big responsibilities to show them. A fundamental step, it seems to me, is self-recognition that we ourselves are amongst the principal beneficiaries of the current order. And that we will need to be prepared to give up many of our accumulated class privileges in order to dismantle the deeply entrenched structures of social and economic exclusion. To create a society based on equity and social justice, and to fully liberate the huge creative potential that evidently resides in the mass of the population. Another need is to recover, nurture, foster and encourage the habit of what Lloyd Best called independent thought. 
reading the policy discourse in the, in the Jamaican media, one sometimes gets the feeling that elites <clears throat> are caught in a kind of neoliberal time warp. The mantra that the less regulation, the better, and that the private sector are, by definition, the good guys, and the states are, by definition, bad guys, has been blown away for several years by a succession of financial crises, and most especially recently <clears throat> by the crisis which began in 2008. Think of Clico. Think of Stanford. Think of Madoff. Think of Enron and the rest. Think of the huge cost to the Jamaican taxpayer of Air Jamaica after privatization. Think of the egregious corruption on a massive scale on Wall Street, costing trillions of dollars and throwing as a, in its economic consequences, millions of persons into unemployment and poverty all over the world. Think of Iceland. The idea that you can fix an economy by draconian austerity measures has been disproved by the cases of Greece, Spain, the United Kingdom, and by IMF programs in Eastern Europe and the ongoing Eurozone crisis. Internationally, the extreme form of neoliberalism that still seems to be accepted here, internationally is under fire and in retreat. I am not sure that the policy discourse has taken these developments on board or interpreted their implications of taking a fresh look at the paradigm that informs and guides economic policy in Jamaica. Research undertaken by the United Nations Committee on Development Policy, for instance, on development policies, followed by dozens of countries since 1980, has concluded that the Washington consensus model, quote, has not delivered its promised acceleration in growth. And <coughs> on balance, quote, seems to have been associated with reductions in growth and worsening income distribution. Also in the conclusions is that the countries which did the best were those that liberalized selectively mixing orthodox and unorthodox policies, and we can give the references to this. Re recovering the, in the intellectual and the regulatory capacity to undertake such selective policies must surely be a strategic objective of the Jamaican state. To this end, one immediate action could be to impose a freeze on further incursions into the space of national policy making, known in the jargon as national policy space. For example, the economic partnership agreement with the EU gave away far more policy space than was required by the rules of the World Trade Organization. And Jamaica is now having serious problems in its implementation. The tariff cuts, which were supposed to have been made beginning at the beginning of this year, have not been done. The small manufacturers are reporting major problems in entering the European market. And the service exporters are also which were supposed to be amongst the principal beneficiaries, are having problems with so-called mutual recognition agreements. That EPA is due for a comprehensive review in the year 2013. And this could be an opportunity to revisit it. But it is an opportunity which would, which would need to be fully prepared. We can also resist making the same kinds of concessions in the Canadian 
free trade agreement, which is now under negotiation. And the same principle of enlarging national policy space might apply to the ongoing IMF negotiations. Economists will recognize that what I'm talking about here is the need for a developmental state. But there's an important caveat. That isn't going to work unless the society has confidence in the technical competence and the incorruptibility of state officials. In other words, there have to be muscular mechanisms for transparency and accountability in policy making. And that is one of the lessons of the success of the developmental states of East Asia. In the final part of my reflections, I want to say something about regionalism and linking regionalism to the strategic objective of the recovery of policy independence. 50 odd years ago, CLR James said that federation was the only means by which the West Indies could take its place in the community of modern nations. The federation failed, but today Jamaica and other CARICOM states are experiencing the illusions of insular independence. I think CLR James has been vindicated. I am not advocating a new federation, but I do see the need for a much stronger Caribbean community to consolidate our collective identity as a Caribbean people and to cope more effectively with the world of the 21st century, a world which is infinitely more complex, more demanding, and more fast changing than the world in which we assumed nationhood half a century ago. Trade preferences are on the way out. Aid flows have been cut. The Caribbean does not have the strategic importance in the context of a Cold War that it used to have. There is a world food crisis, a world energy crisis, and a world environmental crisis. Transnational criminal organizations commanding huge resources, greatly in excess of those of our government, have helped to push up our murder rates to be among the highest <laughs> in the world. Demands on governments are exploding while resources are shrinking and the debt burdens are amongst the highest in the world and are growing. In a recent paper, I spoke of the looming possibility of a perfect storm. I think one is actually on the horizon. <laughs> a perfect storm of, interesting develop of intersecting developments that could end up profoundly affecting the existence of Caribbean societies as we know them existential threats. Natural disasters are not just natural disasters. They pose very sharply the question of the distribution of suffering, the distribution of impact, and the distribution of the costs. The silver lining on these storm clouds is that the reconfiguration of the global economy has opened up new opportunities in trade, investment, and tourism. Any idea that countries of our size can individually mobilize the critical mass of resources and diplomatic clout to deal with these issues, any such idea is quite frankly delusional. Much larger countries than ours are forming regional blocks. And CARICOM is the natural alliance block for Jamaica by history, by size, by culture, and geography. George Beckford used to say 
The people of the Caribbean are already integrated. The only people who don't know it are the politicians. <laughs> I want to tell you that when Jamaica took one, two, three in the 200 meters, the entire region stood up and shared. <laughs> when the reggae boys went to football World Cup, I can tell you, the whole region was behind us. When the mighty West Indian <coughs> cricket team regularly vanquished all adversaries back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Who cared which island Viv Richards came from? Or Holding? Or Lara? Or Lloyd? I know. Lloyd doesn't even come from an island. <laughs> I understand that Jamaica has a problem with exporting to Trinidad. There are ways in which to deal with this. Of course, we often quarrel amongst ourselves. But that is what families do. <laughs> Common sense suggests that, for example, we should pool or at least collaborate in overseas political and commercial representation. In Beijing, in which I was on a visit a couple of years back, to find that Jamaica and some other CARICOM countries have offices, but each with a handful of professionals, two or three or four, each one trying to use three or four professionals to service a vast country of 1.3 billion people, which is said to become the largest economy in the world. Surely it would be more effective to pool these resources so that specialist expertise can be deployed in particular areas. But it seems that there is a mindset of competitiveness and rivalry that seems to prevail. At the Shanghai Trade Fair in 2010, there was a CARICOM house, but each country had its own booth. There was no coherence and no Caribbean brand. You would think that if Chinese tourists are going to come all the way across the world to visit the Caribbean, one could think of promoting a Caribbean experience with multiple de destinations. There is a fear of a new federation of surrendering, surrendering our... Exactly. <laughs> We need to make the distinction between de jure sovereignty and de facto sovereignty. De jure sovereignty is a question of the constitution and of the law. De facto sovereignty is the actual ability to make and execute national policy independent of external constraints. As I see it, the issue for Jamaica and other CARICOM members is how to engineer an expansion of our de facto sovereignty by sharing our de jure sovereignty in particular areas. In a paper which I helped to prepare along with Havelock Brewster and others in 2011, Havelock is right here with us, we proposed four areas for shared sovereignty. The common markets, external trade policy, regional security, and environment and climate change. We also propose a joint action, collective action, in three sectors where tangible benefits could be realized. Agriculture and food security, maritime transport, and renewable energy production. I still believe that these proposals offer a way to rescue the regional project. So I'm winding up, I'm winding up with a vision. I said earlier that I've never recognized any contradiction between a Jamaican nationalist, between being a Jamaican nationalist and a Caribbean regionalist. 
So I'd like to share with you my vision for our community of Caribbean nations. You might say that it is utopia, but does not our national anthem pray to give us vision, lest we perish? So here it is. We envision, and this was adopted in some official document, I don't know if anybody remembers it. We envision a Caribbean community in which every citizen has the opportunity to realize his or her human potential and is guaranteed the full enjoyment of their human rights in every sphere, in which social and economic justice is enshrined in law and embedded in practice. A community from which poverty, unemployment, and social exclusion have been banished, in which all citizens willingly accept a responsibility to contribute to the welfare of their fellow citizens and to the common good, and one which serves as a vehicle for the exercise of the collective strength of the Caribbean region and the affirmation of the collective identity of the Caribbean people in the world community. And then a few weeks ago, someone sent me an independence wish for Jamaica, which is amazing because it is completely consistent with the vision that I've just read. It's Hope McNish, and I hope she's here. I hope Hope is here this week. Hope. This is Hope's independence, which I was so moved by this, in fact, I would thought it would make a very good manifesto for our second independence. It calls in part, quote, for a nation that is not subject to manipulation by external powers and the dictates of international financial institutions. A nation in which there is scientific and technological support and guidance to our farmers, ensuring that all arable lands are fully utilized for organic farming in order to provide our people with healthy nutrition. A nation in which there is a strong manufacturing industry utilizing the latest technology and our skills, creativity, ingenuity, and entrepreneurial talents to produce high quality goods for the local and export markets. A nation in which all our natural resources are harnessed and developed for the benefit of the people. And it goes on in similar vein with wishes for employment, education, housing, public transport, health care, public access to all beaches, environmental protection, true rehabilitation of prisoners, accountability for political representatives, and citizens' rights, to all of which I say, amen. <laughs> the cynics will say it cannot happen. I say that if Marcus Garvey had not dreamed if the leaders of the 1930s had not dreamed, if Usain Bolt had not dreamed, would, be, would we be where we are today? So I say to hope, go for it. Because without the hopes of this world, what hope would we have as a country and a region? Well, People, I started on a personal note, and I will end on one. I hope I have been forgiven for this. Some of you who know me know that my son is presenting at this conference. And you, Alexander, and your generation stand on the cusp of your own life's journey 
as Jamaica faces the challenge of its second independence, as I and my generation did on the cusp of Jamaica's first half a century ago, and I'm speaking to all those of his generation, let us say the under 30s. So in some ways, this conference is like the handing over of the baton. But I just want to remind him and everyone else that the runner who passes the baton keeps on running, <laughs> at least for a while, and cheers on his successors. We don't know what kind of Jamaica there will be when the centenary is celebrated in 2062. What we do know is that while most people, perhaps, present in this auditorium tonight won't be around to see it, I know I certainly don't have any plans to be around. <laughs> <laughs> but some of you, some of you may have the good fortune to be. And you and your children have a great responsibility. Perhaps you will even remember this moment. So my final message is, it was the Honorable Bob Nari who sang, some people have hopes and dreams. Some people have dreams. And my message to that generation is, always be bold enough to have hopes and dreams. And always have an unshakable confidence in the ability and the will of our people to find the ways and means to realize them. Thank you very much. understand why I felt privileged to be here tonight, and he told you uh, that he was going to be critical. Uh, I don't believe you have been disappointed in either way. I have an announcement to make before we go into the discussion session. The cultural evening is going to be held downstairs in what is called the country kitchen uh, between 7 and 10 p.m. So because of the inclement weather, they have moved the, the function downstairs. Okay, so after this session, we will have the cultural evening downstairs in the country kitchen um, which between 7 and 10. Okay, we have some time for some questions and uh, some discussion. I, I think Norman is very keen to get as much um, discussion as possible. There's a microphone there, so could I invite um, sets of questions so that he can respond in some kind of coherent, interconnected manner. As you, inter as you go to the mic, please introduce yourself so we can make these connections among ourselves. Can the technical persons help? It, I'm sick and tired of okay. these technical persons. They're always not around when we need them. Yeah. I think we're on. Annoying. If I'm a little boy, you're going to the dance and you're, where's the electrician? Where's the electrician? Come on, guys. It's on. Um, Elisa Trotz from Ghana and University of Toronto. I wanted to commend Norman to just such an inspirational um, an inspirational presentation. And I have one question, and the other one is probably a comment challenge question for Selise. Um, you were talking, Norman, at the very end in terms of how we move forward from here, carving out a policy space. And one of the questions I have for you, especially with regard to the EPA, is that we know that at the time when the Caribbean was forced um, or convinced its population of the region that we had to sign or we would be shut out of the European market, that we actually managed to get into the EPA agreement that provision that there would be a review process. The question is, has there been any consistent regional mechanism to ensure that the data has been gathered, collected, will be in a state that we can analyze it so that we can actually come up with a proper analysis backed up by the evidence by the time that that review process comes around. And it seems to me that that is not necessarily the case, and I wanted to ask you. 
And the second point is, you're very consistent with your rounds, and one of the things that you talked about in relation to the EPA was te technification, and the way in which that whole agreement process shut people out from the, the, the everyday effects of it on people's lives. Um, so the other dimension has to be, how do we popularize, whether it's EPA or CARICAN, how do we make that process relevant and meaningful to the lives of people across the region? And it can be done, the Haitians have shown us that it can be done, and that's my perhaps question or challenge to Cedesis perhaps, that colleagues in Cedesis, supported by all of us who are interested in this, can find ways to transform these thousands of pages of documents into language that people across the Caribbean can understand and have a meaningful input in this. Lauren, my question also relates to technical agreements. You raised the issue of the technical competence of state officials. And I'm wondering if to the best of your knowledge, you can tell us whether there's any truth to the rumor that many agreements are signed without the state officials fully understanding the implications of the document, or even worse, are signed on red. Or in, in the policy making world. Um, 
And then if, if that is the case, what intellectual or policy options do you think that could give us in, in the Caribbean in terms of redefining our role in policy and policy related legislation and social change? That's the first one. Second one, uh, you spoke to muscular mechanism. It sounds well, no, I don't want to say massive, but you know. But if it sounds down really rough, that kind of so I want you to really elaborate what the muscular mechanism meant, meant in terms of uh, consequences, fines, prison, I'm not sure. But you refer to it in terms of accountability. So if you could elaborate on that as well. And uh, give that discussion, we have not been having nearly enough of a conversation about the poor capability of our institutions. And I wondered if you could give me a comment on that. Thanks. Uh, how are you, Stevie? Uh, so, you know what I, I basically am asking you about civil society. About? Civil society. I'm a great proponent of civil society. Um, on the one hand, I blame the politicians enormously for the mess they're in. But I also have to admit that the people of the country have been acquiescent yes, in yes. that mess. And therefore, they are responsible too. Yeah, yeah. But on the other side of the ledger is the fact that over the last few decades, civil society has been waking up. And it has come to life nine days after the extradition of Dulu. Which itself, that incursion, with the massacre that went with it, no less a massacre that took place after Paul Vogler and Sam Sharp, but which did not destroy the fact that that incursion was a, a momentous event in Jamaica. It has created a death blow to the garrison and therefore remove one of the weapons that the parties have used all along, which is violence. So the point is that civil society born an organization born nine days after, but which was highly responsible in, in my view for the actual extradition, even more so than the Americans wanting it, uh, indicate the power of civil society and its potential in the common career. I'm wondering on your opinion. Good afternoon, City Chambers, uh, Bureau of Women's Affairs. Um, I know you mentioned, thanks, uh, Prof, for that excellent presentation. You stated that development is a cultural process and it comes from within. Um, however, I was a bit taken aback that most of your critical reflections were um, economic. Uh, could you give us some of those critical reflections from a cultural perspective, um, given the fact that we would love uh, to achieve some level of development in the next 50 years? Thank you. Um, I have a question, Arthur Thompson, citizen. Um, could, you give, <laughs> could you give some comment on the concept of the private sector as the engine of growth? Um, you um, gave a very interesting talk, reflections on 50 years, but I'm not quite seeing what is preventing the private sector from doing uh, much better than they have done, or probably have done something. Okay. I just want to call your attention to the large number of women speaking of, part of private sector, a growing dimension, and extremely important. Okay, I'm going to try and um, to respond to each of the questions in turn. Um, the, is it? No? Yeah, yeah. As a, as a result of the concerns expressed about the EPA and especially the pressure from the government of Guyana, a, a review clause was inserted at the 11th hour, providing for a comprehensive review of the agreement within the first five years. And the terms of reference 
for that agreement include a reference to its impact on um, different groups in the society, in, including young people, farmers, uh, workers, um, women, and uh, a number of identified groups. But as you will, as your question implies, in order to take advantage of this, there has to be um, research, there has to be monitoring of its consequences, there has to be a great deal of technical preparation, and, but more than anything else, there has to be a, um, a mindset that says this agreement may, in its, in its totality, may not really have been in our best interest, and it, we were forced to do it because of the threat of um, cutting off the export markets, but we need to use the time to um, basically pre pre prepare the case for a different kind of agreement. And that mindset is not present. I'm not seeing it. That mindset, which is, as you say, which, 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 which is a critical um, reflection, if you like, on the overall assumptions and structure and architecture of the agreement and the way in which a different kind of agreement or even a modified agreement could be crafted to be supportive of development, I'm not seeing it. And even from the narrow, press, the narrow point of view of monitoring its, its um, effects, I know of no mechanism which has been set up, certainly not regionally, um, and I, I don't believe nationally, with that in mind. What is being monitored is the, monitored is the implementation of the commitments, but the consequences are not being, as far as I know, are not being um, monitored. So that is where we, our weakness is a self-imposed one. Um, technification, and your question really has to do, and I think it was directed as much to Salises, one of the big one of the big challenges of globalization is the technical way in which issues in trade and finance are communicated and the, the, the way in which this discourse is conducted. I can tell you that when the global financial crisis broke, I spent a, a lot of time trying to get my head around the complex issue of derivatives, what is it, credit default swaps, and a whole, whole heap of these other very technical terms having to do with high finance. And the people who are in that world use that knowledge and use that language to befuddle the rest of us, including, including prime ministers, ministers of finance, presidents, etc. So that, you know what happened when Obama came to power and he turned right back to the, these same guys to be his chief economic advisors. And I think one of the big challenges for the academic community is to really you know, understand what lies, what are the social relationships which lie behind um, these technical terms. A bailout, for example, what a bailout really means is to compensate lenders for their bad lending decisions by taking the money from taxpayers, from workers, from women and children, from schools, from teachers. That is what a bailout means. But the term bailout is used and it sounds like, oh gosh, well, the boat is sinking, so we're going to bail it out. So it's a good thing to do. So that business of um, technification and as I say, exposing what lies behind these techniques, I think is a real challenge for the academic and the intellectual community. Now, um, Carolyn, Professor Cooper, is there any rumor in the, is there truth in the rumor that some of these matters are, um, uh, agreements are signed on to on red? I have to say um, that I believe there is some truth in that rumor, yes. I have to say that from my knowledge of, um, these processes, certainly in the case of at least one outstanding case, which is, uh, you know, the document was lying in front of heads of government. I don't think they had read it, quite, quite honestly. And, but more than reading it is to understand its implications uh, uh, in terms of the implementation requirements, the money, the institution, and the way in which policy space would be restricted by what was... Um, what was in the text. I don't think there was a full understanding of it. And I think we are still at this stage, people are discovering 
um, what the, the full implications of the agreement. I also wonder, you know, I printed out the, um, the structural reform agenda of the government of Jamaica, which was part of the letter of intent of December or November 2010. And, you know, this is small type. These are something like 40 odd actions of structural reform. This is the public domain. This is a le published on the IMF website. And when I read through them, I mean, I read through them with, with growing disbelief. And I really wonder if government officials really believe when they signed on to this agenda, um, really believe that they could be implemented. We heard Colin Bullock say yesterday that we haven't done the things that we are supposed to have done, and therefore the IMF is now requiring action before we, are, we, we sign a new agreement. Well, these are the things that we have not done, but I don't know which government in the world could actually have done all of these things in the space, some of them, most of them in the space of a single fiscal year. I mean, to be quite honest, it seems to me that this is an agreement that was programmed to fail. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Everybody must have known this. <laughs> have known that. Okay. So, um, Carolyn, I hope that that is uh, responsive. Now, Jerry, um, hmm? Hmm? yes, the tribal politics. Absolutely. Um, there was an institution. There was a transfer of uh, of power in 1962. I remember very well. There was a big debate about this constitution. It was hurriedly drafted, prepared, and agreed. I think, it, uh, 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 and there were some public hearings, but they were just for, for, um, for um, you know, for show, sure, for show, sure, really. What it did was to transfer power to a party duopoly, an institutionalized party duopoly. You know, the, kind of the, the way the thing is set up, there are certain things in the Constitution, I think you know, where the, the vote of, a, of a, an opposition senator is required, and if not, you have to go to a, to a referendum. So there was, you know, there was a, there was a deal, and that deal was the power would go to these two, um, these two, these, these two parties. And I think the composition of the panel, um, some people may may feel upset at the, the vigor of your protests, but quite honestly, I think you have a substantive point. The composition of that panel, yeah? No, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all. Very interesting, but the, the, the composition, uh, it, it, I have to tell you, and I think Brian is here, I have to tell you that when I read the program, and I read where there was going to be a panel on detribalizing politics, and the only people on the panel were the people who themselves are practicing politicians, I, I, it, 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 it kind of, I couldn't really get my head around it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Tai Tu, no, very interesting question about neoliberalism. Is it in, in what sense is neoliberalism in retreat? I would say it is in, first of all, it is very definitely in retreat in academic circles. There is a great deal of, of critical literature on um, neoliberalism and a, and a great deal of critical literature on the Washington Consensus, which, is, which goes back to at least the last 10 to 15 years, number one. Number two, in the policy world, in terms of political shifts that have taken place, especially in Latin America in the last 10 to 12 years, the phenomenon of, 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 of Lula, the phenomenon, and, and, and subsequently, the phenomenon of Chavez, this phenomenon of all the revolt against the Washington consensus and neoliberal globalization, which um, is manifested in, in politic, in govern, changes of government in Latin America, but even more especially in the rise of new social movements. And it's quite interesting because these social movements, that development doesn't seem to have um, touched the English-speaking Caribbean to any significant degree, but it is a massive movement, mobilization of, um, of indigenous people, of Afro-descended people, of people represent, of, of environmental groups, and of people who are calling for another kind of world, another world is possible. And in that sense, also neoliberalism. It is also in neoliber in retreat in in the in the um, in the in, in the forums of the World Trade Organization. There has been no 
possibility there has been no agreement on the Doha round of the WTO and there because of the of, of, a, of, a, of a disagreement between the um, developed countries and the leading countries of the global south uh, over questions of agricultural subsidies and so on and there was in fact a, a rejection um, by the south of the of the northern agenda of including new issues on the in the WTO, WTO agreement that is to say issues of intellectual property and competition and investment and so on so it is in retreat in that sense and at those levels but it is not yet in retreat or not there are there is a, if you like a converse movement which is takes place in the within our countries which are especially countries which are subjected to IMF conditionalities like ours and like Eastern Europe and like some African countries and and in the Eurozone where you see where the kind of solutions which are still being pushed to the, the, the crisis are solutions, if you like, of a, of a fiscal compression, neoliberal kind. And I would say, um, Taitu, that one of the major issues we need to look at is not just the formal conditionalities in these agreements, but the way in which entire generations of persons who constitute the policy elites have been trained and education in the ideology of neoliberalism so that even when institutions may not be requiring certain kinds of policies that it, they are thinking within a certain framework and a certain paradigm which predisposes them to certain kinds of solutions and excludes other kinds of policy instruments. And the, and the fundamental uh, assumption of that paradigm is that markets know best. So in that sense, we have a, <laughs> a, a big problem. Um, <laughs>